Right. Welcome everybody to a new iteration of our Klingon Center Conversations in Modern Irish Culture, History, Literature, uh, and the Economy. And this is part of a recurring series of interviews with authors, uh, with policymakers, and others who are shaping not just modern Ireland today, but also Ireland's past uh, Irish literature. And it's an enormous privilege today to welcome Kian McMahon, who is Associate Professor of History at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and is a very, very productive uh, scholar in modern Irish history. And I'll tell you a bit about Kian's work in a moment. But before I do, I want to also introduce to you the Klingon Family Center for the Study of Modern Ireland, which is a new initiative of the Keogh Naughton Institute here at the University of Notre Dame. And I'm a visiting faculty fellow here at the Klingon Center, and our task is to explore modern Ireland in all of its shapes and forms, and to bring Ireland to the world and the world to Ireland, which has also been the mission of the Keogh Naughton Center for nearly 30 years now. The Institute celebrates its 30th anniversary next year. The Klingon Center is an exciting new departure for the Institute, and this series is a part of that. So with all of that said, uh, Kian McMahon is our guest. Now, he wrote, and this is the subject of our talk, The Coffin Shift, which we will talk about here in a moment, but this is not his only book. And the subtitle is Life and Death at Sea During the Great Irish Famine, published by NYU in their new Irish study series, which I'll be asking Kian about in a moment. But Kian holds a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, an MA from University College Dublin, and a BA, and this gives me great pleasure, from the University of Manitoba. Uh, because we do not get enough Manitoba in Irish studies, uh, or indeed in any aspect of life. Uh, I may also be asking about the fate of the Winnipeg Jets in the upcoming season. Uh, Kian is, as well as a Manitoba boy, uh, an expert on American country music and soccer, both of which he teaches at UNLV, which is one of the great uh, teaching portfolios that I have ever seen. He's the author of The Global Dimensions of Irish Identity, Race, Nation, and the Popular Press, 1840 to 1880, which the University of North Carolina published in 2015, which I think is really just a truly fantastic book. I uh, won an honorable mention uh, for one of the American Conference for Irish Studies book prizes, uh, and I think is really a pioneering work that points to some of the global history that I'll be asking Kian about with his, his new book, The Coffin Ships. Uh, soon he will be co-editing with Kathleen Costello Sullivan, The Routledge History of Irish America, a uh, huge project in scope and I think ultimately in importance when it appears in due course. Uh, but this package of, of research, Kian, is, is has been astonishing to me seeing how much has been coming from you so quickly uh, and on the, the global scale of it. So I'd like to begin, I think, with the most obvious question is, what was it about, and you, you're open very, about this right up front in the introduction, that actually things aren't maybe quite as bad, that the coffin ship itself is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, obviously, the, the old story from journalism applies, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, if it's grim, it sells books. But what drew you to telling this story that, as your introduction has it, is one that sort of everybody thought they knew, but perhaps, or and some historians sensed it wasn't perhaps the, the myth of Irish America that everybody dies on the boat. Why write a book length treatment of this? Why is this not an article length uh, topic, just setting aside some of the, the dry numbers and statistics and you know we think deaths were X and actually they were Y. Why a book? Well, thanks, Colin. Uh, thanks for that uh, warm introduction and, uh, and, and for, for having me here. It's great to be uh, on this uh, part of this new initiative. Um, I was inspired to write The Coffin Ship uh, when I was attending a lecture uh, at the University of Pittsburgh many years ago when I was still a PhD student uh, candidate, I suppose, at Carnegie Mellon. And um, the talk had nothing to do with Irish history. The talk was by a uh, leading historian of maritime social history uh, named Marcus Redeker. And Marcus was telling us about a new book he was doing called The Slave Ship. And what Marcus wanted to understand was the ways in which the social dynamics in the, on a slave ship impacted the experience of that in-between space 
where the slaves were no longer in Africa, but were not yet uh, in the New World, in the Americas. And I walked home from that lecture thinking to myself, you know, that's exactly what Irish studies needs. You know, we need more maritime history uh, in Irish history. And I thought to myself, like, what would a book like that look like? Like the slave ship, okay, so the Irish, no, the coffin ship it was so obvious. As a child growing up in Dublin, I had heard the legends and the stories of coffin ships, uh, et cetera, during the famine. But I always felt like the story was a little, um, was a little too simple. And here's the reason why, was because while the coffin ship was, as a, as a trope, is designed to in, in elicit uh, sympathy and empathy for these, for these people who have gone through so much. It also does a terrible violence to their memory by stripping them of their agency, their creativity. And I had a feeling that there was more going on in the lives of the emigrants than merely lying prone in the bottom of a wooden box waiting to die. Because that's what you do in a coffin, right? You're dead, you lie there. And so when I got the inspiration from the slave ship, and then I realized, and then I put that with my own memories of what was going on and, and, and this feeling like there was more to be told about the experience of emigration during the famine. The third dynamic that brought it all together was the realization that there were, that I could find lots of letters and diaries of emigrants themselves. So historians of the slave trade, of course, are stuck by the fact that it's almost impossible to find the, um, excuse me, records in their own words of slaves. But the Irish were different because the Irish, we have letters and diaries. So the first person I turned to is, of course, Kirby Miller, whose own collection of these letters and diaries is second to none. I also got a lot of help from Peter Gray and his, uh, who is, who works at Queen's University Belfast, which hosts the open access uh, DIPAM archive. So when I put those three factors together, Colin, I realized this is about, I wanna write this book because I wanna read this book. I wanna find out what life was like for the immigrants themselves. So um, so yeah, so that's, that's why I did it. Well, that's fascinating. I think one thing I wanted to pick up on because it, it struck me in, in, in looking through the book that one of the other departures that, that is, is not just starting with maritime history, which is, is a really interesting departure in Irish histories. We don't think about maritime history in the Irish, which is odd when you consider how much, how much of a role the sea has played, migration across the sea, fishing, the Newfoundland cod fishery, any number of different things. But of course, the, the, the migrant experience and letters, it's not just Kirby Miller who's done that, David Fitzpatrick and Oceans of Consolation, and I was thinking in terms of this source base, is, is there a distinct source base specifically dedicated to migrant journal, or are you plowing some of the same furrows as Miller and Fitzpatrick and pulling different things? Is, is, how does this, is this building on that? I mean, obviously it's building to a certain extent, but where does this fit in that, that literature of scholarly analysis of migrant letters? Yeah, so what uh, the thing about 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 migrant letters is anybody who who employs them as a as a source will tell you is that is that um, they're in in some ways they're very different from other prime primary sources. Uh, they're more difficult to access. Um, they often lack a context uh, that that we would uh, enjoy with other sources. But but they're also like other primary sources in that you can return to them time and time again with new questions and they'll always turn up new things. I'll, I'll give you an example, right? So on the first book, that, which you mentioned before, The Global Dimensions of Irish Identity, I was really interested in how Irish people in the mid 19th century uh, talked out loud about race. And, uh, and I knew that there's a difference. I know that there's a difference between how, how human beings talk about identity and race when they're in public and how they talk about it when they're in private. So I tried to do both. I tried to, I tried to track how Irish people talked about race in newspapers, articles, journal, or editorials, et cetera. And then I tried to see how they talked about race in private using their letters and diaries. And the idea was that I would kind of cross-reference these, overlay these. Well, the problem is <laughs> Irish people didn't talk about race in their personal <laughs> letters. Very rarely, they talked about things like the price of butter. Uh, 
Um, but what I did find, which was fascinating to me, was that at the end of many of these immigrant letters, they would say things like, uh, please find and close the copy of our, our local Boston newspaper. Uh, uh, please send over a copy of a Dublin paper. Uh, I'd love to get caught up on, on what's happening. And, and so using those letters, I realized that other than, let's say, remittances, prepaid tickets, uh, I would say that newspapers were the most commonly posted, mailed item amongst immigrants in the mid-19th century. This blew my mind because it opened up to me the degree to which there was a transnational network of exchange amongst Irish people in both letters and newspapers at the same time. And so, it, so, so that's kind of the angle that I try to bring, the new angle that I try to bring in using immigrant letters is that I try to, I try to use them to, to execute a, uh, an analytical framework, which I've come to describe as compare, contrast, and connect. Uh, Kevin Kenny wrote this fantastic article in 2003 in the Journal of American History, which I, I, I still read. <laughs> it's, it's grubby. It's underlined so much. It doesn't mean anything anymore. I started highlighting and then I did so much of that. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just a mess. But the point is, is that there's two ways that, that historians tend to think of how they do transnational history. One is to compare and contrast how the Irish in Boston feel about an issue, how the Irish in Australia, how the Irish... Uh, and then the other one is to connect the dots between them to show the ways in which the Irish in Boston are impacting the Irish in Melbourne, are impacting uh, the Irish in Buenos Aires. And so historians, you know, when we could think of the ways that historians conceptualize their work, they often think of those two as separate, as separate kind of methodologies. Kevin Kenny said, we need to do them together. And so that's what I've done. And of course, I'm not the only one. I mean, in your own work, you, 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 you've done your work on the ways in which most recently the Catholic Church, right? It's not just that the Catholics in, in Melbourne, Boston, and Dublin are saying different things, but they're actually connected uh, in your ways with these, with these networks, uh, ecclesiastical networks. Uh, so, so, so that's the way that I try to bring something uh, and new to the study of, of, of immigrant letters. Uh, and newspapers too. Let me pick up on that because I think, and this is probably my own interest in, and biases showing through, but I, I thought one of the most important because in a sense surprising departures in, in the Coffin Ships book was the, the weight placed in Australia. And you're looking through your bibliography and then the archives, I mean, Australia is this and America is this, which in some ways is a tough sell uh, certainly to publishers and in some ways to audiences because of the, the weight of Irish America and as the weight of the coffin ship narrative as being primarily seen as a North Atlantic phenomenon, rightly or wrongly. But tell me, or if you could, tell us a little bit about the decision to include Australia, the weight of Australia. Is this something that's only really relevant in your view for specifically migrant stories? Or is this maybe a way, and you know the answer I would prefer, but I'd like to hear your own, <laughs> as a way to actually bring some freshness to, to, to modern Irish history, to 19th century Irish history, history in particular, is to, is to push it out from the American story or even just the Australian story, but start doing this compare, contrast, and connect. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, if if you're 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 right. If if you look at the bibliography, it looks like Australia uh, is uh, is is out, outweighs uh, the others. Uh, part of that is that uh, I've got so much material uh, from Kirby Miller and Dipam that it that it, <laughs> that what looks like a tiny bit in the bibliography is actually is actually more. Uh, I try to respect the fact uh, that that uh, that that the that the relative numbers of people who left Ireland during the famine and went to let's just use the term North America um, vastly outweighed those who went to went to Australia, uh, and so I tried to make sure that 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 uh, I balanced uh, the narrative in a way that 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 give more uh, that that give an appropriate. Uh, that, that reflected that balance in an appropriate way. I also include convicts. They're a relatively tiny uh, number uh, of the 2.2 million who left. But, but to, to, to answer your question, here's the thing is that uh, there, there's, there's two sides to this, right? So on the, on the first side is 
yeah, I'm just not going to write a book that just goes one direction. It's just not going to happen. It's too boring. I, you know, I really, I believe in the, in the rule of three, you know, uh, if my, if my kid says that, that, that uh, she found something, um, I'll say that, 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 that's great. If she finds a second one, that's a coincidence. It could be a coincidence, but if she finds a third, uh, she's got evidence. Uh, and, and, and in the same way, I feel like if you tell me something about migrants when they're living in Ireland, I'll believe you. If you tell me something that holds true for Ireland and North America, that's pretty compelling. If you find something that's true of Australia too, I think it, it raises the bar uh, in terms of our conclusions about the migrant experience. Um, so, so that's one thing is from an intellectual perspective, I, I'm, I'm just interested in, in widening the net. Um, but, but, the, but, the other, but the other part of that answer is this, is that I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that we need to pursue these studies in ways that, um, shall I say, mm -hmm. I, I believe that we open new ground. I believe that we open new perspectives and, and ideas uh, by including the Australian and the, and, the, and the North American. And one of those ideas that I think we open up is that immigrants at the time that didn't think of if it, it, it as North America is, you know, the United States and Canada. And Irish America didn't exist in the way that it does now in 1845. And so while there were lots of possibilities for immigrants who sought to go to places like North America, uh, there were also lots of possibilities for people who went to Australia. Now, there are real differences, right? Like Australia is incredibly expensive. I talk about some of the price differences. It's about 18 pounds to, to sail from, from Plymouth in England uh, to Australia in this time. It's about four or five pounds to go from Liverpool to New York. So there are real differences. So that means that if you have family who ended up going to Australia, there's a better chance that you'll go to Australia. Um, but, but, that's, but that's the other part of it is that I, I think we, we, we have to be very careful that we don't kind of uh, impose our own ways of thinking about Irish America, Irish Australia uh, on, on the past. And that's why I brought in the convicts too, because people saw ships sailing to Australia and said, if I can get on that thing, I'll get a free ride down to Australia. And a fair number of people did that. No, that, that, that's interesting. I think it, it's, it picks up the sense, um, I like how you contextualize that, is, is we mustn't impose the notion of there's an Irish America in the way it exists in the 20th century, and that that's, that, that's something that makes sense in 1845 or 1855. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking through, through to your first book, and, and to this, these, this interest in, in the global networks, the exchange of information, whether that's a, a ticket prices or come and live in, in Baltimore because there's jobs or whatever it might be in the transmission of newspapers in your first book. Where do you see this going? And I'm thinking Jill Bender's work has a similar international uh, approach. Yours does. Is this, is this your generation of Irish historians, not to make you speak for them, but to make you speak for them, uh, is, is this is this where we're going? Where there's a there's a development in Ireland itself with the focus on the decade of commemorations and the Irish Revolution, and lots of very very good work being done there. But is is this are you and Jill and, and maybe to a certain extent older lags like me? Are we pushing it at a, at a different door, or is the, is this really in your view? Is there more to be done with this? Is this, is this the way of approaching that has a third book for you and a fourth book for you and a fifth book for you? Or is there a natural limit to what this can tell us as historians? Yeah, yeah that's a really, that's a really good question. I sometimes stay up late at night asking myself a similar question. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the reason, uh, you, you know, and so here's the answer that I came up with last, last time I thought about this, uh, because my, my answers uh, obviously change on this, as, as do yours. Um, you know, historians live in, 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 in moments, you know, and, and our work reflects the moments that we live in. And so I don't think that there's, a, that there's a, any surprise. Um, 
like it's an established fact <laughs> that uh, that that the um, that the rise of global history and international history over the last couple of decades ties in with with what we as human society are 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 experiencing now, um, and and so it'll it'll it, it will come and it will go, and I don't know I don't know what's next. Um, I, I don't know what's next, but I do feel like this, like this, like this is a is a good and accurate representation of of making sense of of the world that we live in. Because as historians, we're 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 we we have the opportunity to to prosecute uh, a, um, an intellectual uh, experience uh, that that all humans really uh, should be mindfully engaging with which is which is to make sense of, of to give meaning to our lives do you know what i mean like life does not have any meaning right? unless we impose a meaning on it and people have their own systems and ways of doing that so so as a historian i'm i'm imposing meaning on on things that happened in the past uh, because that makes sense and is fulfilling to, my, to 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 the world that we live in i think it helps to make sense of the world that we live in um and so I see, I, from my own personal um, uh, experience, our uh, thoughts on this, I, I see endless opportunities uh, for this kind of continued global um, globalization or internationalization uh, of Irish history and of, uh, of modern history, obviously, but but of but of Irish history in particular, um, in part because uh, again the, the the sources are. The sources are there; they just haven't been uh, explored. So I'm interested in networks. I, I've talked to you about letter networks of of letters, personal letters. Uh, I've talked about networks of newspapers. You know, there's some folks working on networks of 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 transportation, right? Like shipping networks. Uh, those are those are um, new opportunities of exploration. Um, that that I think that I think there's 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 much work uh, left to be done. I suppose, man, picking up, Ken, on just your point, global history has obviously been a big thing in the profession, and as you quite rightly point out, or at least imply, that academic interest very often follows, essentially follows the job market. Is 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 your PhD student? You're thinking, gosh, well, global history is big. This will increase my chances of getting a job. This sounds terribly cynical, but we all know this is how thing how things work. But I'm actually, as you were speaking, I was struck, maybe the better way to put the question is, is not why is global history drawing scholars like yourself and, and, and others, but actually why is it drawing so few of you in the context of Irish history? Is, is as you, you work your way through the books that are, that are being produced in the last few years, actually books like yours are relatively rare. And I'm wondering, is this, is this oh, I can tell you why. Okay, go on. I'd love to hear. <laughs> no, okay. because Colin, you see, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you. This is this is great. This is why I love having a conversation with someone like you because you go through these experiences yourself, and you don't want. You have to. Uh, I, I just appreciate this conversation because it, it's great to talk to someone like you about this stuff because you struggle with it. Look, one reason is it's hard. Like it's difficult, you know. Uh, the humanities are under attack from all angles. We're constantly having the tap on funding squeeze tighter and tighter and tighter. Go to the chair of your department and say, "I need to go to Australia for two weeks," and then I need, and then I'd love to get back. I have to, I have to go through London one more time, and this is for somebody living in Las Vegas, right? And then I need to go to Dublin. Well, I have to, I'm going to be in Dublin for a while, obviously. You know, uh, and then Toronto, Montreal, hoping to hit that later in the semester. Uh, obviously, New York, right? As Irish America, I have to do New York. I mean, it's um, just the funding alone. Just the funding alone uh, is a constant uh, battle. Uh, so, so, so that's so that's one reason that I think that 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 people are are leery of taking it on, is because you're essentially committing yourself to a career of shoestring budgets, uh, and I, 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 <laughs> I, and whereas if someone is living in uh, Dublin and they want to do a history of you know something as you said the War of Independence. Uh, 
and all the archives they need there are are there on Kildare Street. Like, why would you leave? It's 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 the cost of the dart <laughs> into town, and and you're and you're covered. So so that's so that's one thing. That's one reason that I that I that I think it's it's kind of uh, it's it's less popular. The other thing is that uh, is is personal interests. Like, I love traveling. I've always wanted to see Tasmania. Do you know what I mean? So like when I started to put together the fact that like there were fantastic records in Hobart and I could look it up on Google Maps and I could see the corner, the street corners. And I went on to Airbnb and I saw that things were affordable and it would be a half hour walk. But isn't that why I'm going in the first place? You know, there's a sense of adventure and maybe that doesn't uh, appeal to, 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 to others. But that's a big part of it for me, too, is that, uh, you know, I spent my 20s kind of like embarking on international travels on a shoestring budget. So, you know, making a career out of it uh, wasn't that big a leap. Well, I think that there's there's obviously an, an attraction as things you're as, as Tasmania. I mean, there's nothing like walking through the Salamanca markets in, in, in Hobart looking at the, the Arctic ships and then going to your archive uh, to start the day. And I've, I've had that experience and, I, and I, I very much take that point. But maybe what I want, and I'm sure that's right. I'm sure that's a big part of it. And I'm sure funding is a big part of it as well. Of course it is. But I'm struck as well that there's always been a certain number of American trained and American based historians who have as we're done Irish history and we can we, there's a, there's a long and distinguished uh, chain of them and they're they're still they're still here today but I'm wondering again if there is something new in in American history programs I'm thinking of you were at Carnegie Mellon with, with David Miller uh, Jill Bender is another another scholar who's been very global in her interests from the same generation she was at Boston College uh, that there's a strand of modern Irish history that's that's not coming from the Wisconsin school or the or the old Chicago school or is getting trained in Ireland or indeed in, in, in Oxford or Cambridge that has a more global outlook. And if that's a, str a strand in, in American preparation of Irish historians that's something you've seen and think should be fostered. Oh, uh, you know, that that's a really good way to look at it, Colin. That's that's a really good way to look at it, and it was actually an explicit um, an explicit uh, uh, choice that I made when I was uh, figuring out where to do my PhD. You know, uh, I I applied to a, 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 a number of schools. I got into some. I didn't get into others. You know, um, I I did have the opportunity to to study uh, to do my PhD uh, in England, and um, you know, it occurred to me that. Um, and, and and this is not this is not to 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 berate the British system that is that has produced so much. I mean, it's, I mean, incredible scholarship. But I understood that if I went to the United States, that I was going to have to read widely uh, for years uh, before I got to really choose what I wanted to do my PhD on. And so when I went to the United States to, to Carnegie Mellon to study under David Miller. Um, it, it, we didn't sit down and start pounding through 19th century Irish, you know, historiography. Uh, I, I, I read Marcus Redeker's um, The Many-Headed Hydra, you know, and then I read um, uh, Nasty Wenches and uh, Good Wives by uh, Stephanie McCurry. And then I read David Wallstriker's uh, In the Midst of Perpetual Fates, you know, and, 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 and it just went on and on and on. And I was reading all these things that had nothing to do with Irish history. And I, and there were times, and then I was also reading Marx and Gramsci and Weber. And there were times where I felt like I'm paddling really far away from the show. <laughs> I can really, really paddled a long way away from Irish history now, you know. Um, but of course, I had David Miller to, to, to rely on. To, to chat with. Uh, he was such an amazing uh, mentor and, and really, uh, and, and grew into really uh, a great friend. Um, but, but, but I, but, I, but what, what always, what, what kept me going was that I asked for that. You know what I mean? I, I, I wanted, 
I wanted to, to, to know something about the historiography of revolutionary America. I wanted to know something um, about um, Central Europe uh, when we did those pro seminars. And so I felt like when I came back to Irish history after about two or three years of reading other things, I felt like the, like the, like the world was kind of open to me. And, and there were two books that came together that led to my, that my, to, that led to my dissertation. The first was Kirby Miller's Immigrants and Exiles. So David Miller told me, you should read this book. And I told David, well, I'm not really interested in immigration and Irish migration. I mean, I was interested actually in, in what you might call Irish foreign affairs before, um, uh, be before the, the foundation of the state. What, what we now think of as, as um, uh, empire studies, you know. Um, uh, I was interested in that. Um, so I read uh, Stephen Howe's Ireland and Empire, blew my mind. I was like, yeah, there's so many things to do there. That's fantastic. But David Miller was like, well, just, would you just read Kirby Miller's Emigrants Next? Like, just do it, please. And I read it. And here's what, here's what, here's what got me was that I had thought of Irish emigration history in my own ignorance as a study that started on the American shores, a study that started at Castle Garden or whatever, and that the story of, of how that was connected to Ireland, that those were two separate stories. Kirby Miller's book opened my eyes to the fact that you couldn't understand Irish America until you spent hundreds of pages, hundreds of pages reading about Irish history and modern Ireland. Or the you know the 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 art the the environment they came from, and so in that way that that kind of like transnational history kind of opened my mind. And the second book was David Rodiger's The Wages of Whiteness, followed by Noel Ignatieff's How the Irish Became White, which exactly lacked that transnational, which is interesting study and has lots of interesting things to say about uh, the Irish and white supremacy. Uh, but that it was so rooted in, in the United States, it wasn't linked to where the Irish came from. So I said, if Kirby Miller wrote Wages of White was Whiteness, what would happen? And that's how I came up with my first book. So, 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 so that's, 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 my, that's, my, that's my very long-winded uh, answer to your uh, short question, uh, was that uh, I think that the American system encourages you to paddle away from what feels safe and then come back to it with fresh eyes. And to me, transnational and what became global history was the biggest was the biggest thing that came out of that. Well, let me pick up on that phrase, fresh eyes. So if, if you were, as indeed I'm about to ask you, asked to say, what is, what is fresh? What did you bring from that experience of, of Kirby Miller, uh, reading Kirby Miller, of being taught by David Miller, of being at Carnegie Mellon, of that wide reading of Gramsci, of Marx, of the wages of whiteness and so on. What flows through to the coffin ships? How do you, if you look at that book, what is the, what are the, what are, what did your fresh eyes bring to that story? My fresh eyes brought to the story the notion that the networks that 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 the that the that, that human society has built over in, in the modern period has, has continued to build up international networks and transnational networks of, 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 of exchange. And, and that those networks and do more than just connect a, a, a dot, two dots on the map. Um, because if we think of it, if we think of a connection as something that connects the two, we neglect the fact that I'm not the first to suggest this. If you pick up any issue of the Journal of Global History, you'll see someone saying this, is that it's, it's, the, it's the connection itself. It's the strand on which that information travels that, that, that has an impact on it. And so I think, so what changed for me was the idea not only that that there were Irish people living around the world who had their own interesting versions or uh, uh, dimensions of Irishness, but what changed for me was the was 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 interrogating the networks that connected them that connected them and and I think that that is probably that is probably the thing that 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 impacted me the most, other than 
you would say race, class, gender, which I mean, when, when I would did my master's in UCD under Michael Laffin in 2002, I had a fantastic experience. Michael and I had many good laughs and, and <laughs> got a bunch of great work done together. It was great. Um, we didn't talk really uh, about race and class uh, in, in Dublin in the early 2000s. Um, when I came over to America, that's all they wanted to talk about was race, class, and gender. Uh, and so, so, so that, just, that just kind of broke the mold. And I said, you know, what else can I learn uh, from being here? Let me pick up on that race, class, and gender for a moment. It, it, it strikes me, and, and we've been talking about this here in, in, in the Klingon Center and in the Keo Notwood Center, is that class seems to have receded a bit as, as, a, as a useful category to Irish historians writing about contemporary Ireland. It still, as it were, lingers perhaps in, in, in some of the older scholarship for Irish America. Where does class fit into to this story, to the coffin ship story for you as a, as, a, as, a, as a category of analysis? Yeah, so I don't use it as a, um, I, I don't use it as a, um, as a category, as an explicit category of analysis in the way that I have in, in, in previous work. I wrote an article on, on the Young Islanders as global celebrities. It was building on something that Kirby Miller had written many years ago. It's using Antonio Gramsci's um, ideas to make sense of how did a bunch of middle class, uh, uh, well off bourgeois uh, leaders convince, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of working class uh, Irish that they were that they were of that they that they were their suitable leaders. So how did they connect with their lower class? But also, how did they simultaneously connect with with the waspish? Uh, Protestants uh, in the United States who were a little concerned. Uh, so, so I have, so I have tried to, I, ha I have used it as an explicit category. Uh, in this book, I'm primarily interested in the ex in the lived experiences uh, of, excuse me, of working class, what we call working class peasant uh, Irish immigrants. And so, the degree to which I use class is in is is in kind of subtle or implicit ways. And that is the ways in which um, upper class connected people of power are enabling the migration system uh, by, by, by connecting dots uh, for, for poor working class people. So for example, uh, people like Lord Monteagle are writing letters to Australia saying, hey, listen, I just have uh, 15, 20 immigrants that just got on the ship, the Lady Peel. They'll be there, I don't know, soon, like in a couple of months. Uh, can you meet them? Can you check on them? Can you take care of them? Uh, uh, Monteagle is, is lending money uh, to, to people who want to emigrate and they're writing letters back. And these letters are in the, in the National Library saying, hey, listen, thanks very much for that 20 pounds. Here's 10 back. I'll give you the next 10 by Christmas, that kind of thing. Um, so um, they're, they're also writing letters uh, of reference uh, for convicts who are trying to uh, reconstitute their families. Uh, but, I, but I don't, but, but it's true. I don't use classes like the, this isn't a book about class. And, and it's true, you know, generally speaking, I mean, Irish history, uh, the historiography of modern, modern Ireland class has always operated in a kind of a, a difficult in part because of the civil war, you know, so the civil war is, 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 is at face value, uh, is, is about disagreements over, over the relationship with Britain. And it's not about, it's not a class war, but of course, this is like an, an illusion, an illusion they're, they're, they're hiding. Um, and so historians, I think, for many years, I mean, you think of people like Anthony Coughlin, he was trying to write Marxist histories of Irish history and not getting a lot of support uh, in the academy or uh, from the public uh, for his work. Uh, so, so I think that's it. I think that's a tricky one. I think there is, there is more work to be done, but it's also part of a broader problem in, in modern historiography where people are wondering if really those class categories are too rigid to really be effective in the ways that power flows. So hmm, it's a good question. I don't really have a final answer for you, Colin. 
no, it, 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 that suggests it's a good thing to explore further. So I want to ask you one last uh, one last question just before we we wrap up, and it's it's one that I always think about in the context of what is clearly, at least to my mind, I think as the as the reviews come in, I think to everybody's mind, a, a hugely successful book. But how did you go about? This is this is something historians think about: is that that difficult second album? is it, it's such a hard thing to do is to, is to craft that second project, to, to, to land that second project. And I'm curious just if, 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 you could, if you could briefly talk us through the challenge of, of a second monograph, which is, is such a, uh, in some ways the hardest thing in any scholar's career is, is to sit down and do that totally new project. Is how did that work out for you? I mean, it worked, we know how it worked. It worked spectacularly well. How did you stick the landing? <laughs> oh, this coming from someone who has experience with this. I, you know, I would really love it if we could switch the switch seats. These are all questions that I'd love to hear you talk more about, to be completely honest, uh, and your own experiences uh, with this. Um, I, you know, in, in I think I think in some ways I was lucky. Uh, so so uh, so I said that I attended uh, Marcus Redeker's talk about the slave ship, and that's what got me going on the coffin ship. I didn't tell you that I was only about mm, a year or two into my dissertation when I, <laughs> when I got that great idea. So I was carrying around the coffin ship as like this great idea for ages, and I couldn't do anything about it because I had to write an entire dissertation. And then I had to change the dissertation into a book, which took more years. And like by the time the, dis, the book was like ready to set sail, I was so ready. I thought so much about the coffin ship. I had, so that was, that was part of it, was that it had, been, it, had been, it had been gestating in my mind for a while. The other thing was that I got really lucky with some great support from the Center for Irish Studies at, the, at the, in UC Galway and the Irish American Cultural Institute. Uh, I think I, they, they, they supported me. I, I, I rattled off an application just when my book was, first book was finished and they took me up and said, why don't you come to Galway in Dublin and do a bunch of research. So that, so, so there was, so there was the element um, of the timing. Um, I, I agree that the second book is, is a really big challenge. It's, it's, it, but I found it to be, easier in many ways because I, I had a, I had the confidence I, I had I had done it the first time you know my dissertation I enjoyed writing my dissertation but what I ultimately did was I smashed the thing to atoms and I rebuilt it paragraph by paragraph to turn it into a great book or well, what I hoped would be a great book so it was in that smashing and reordering of my dissertation into a book that I figured out how to, and this sounds ridiculous because I had a PhD, but I figured out how to write paragraphs or I figured out, I figured out that, that for me, the paragraph was, was, the, was the lowest common denominator. So I never count my progress in words. When I come home, my wife goes, oh, how's your day? Oh, I've got three paragraphs done. You know what I mean? That, that's how I think about it. And, and so, so when I had, so the idea was gestating for a while, I got great support on the spot. Kirby Miller immediately said, come to Missouri, I'll share my letters with you. Peter Gray helped me out with uh, at figuring out about DIPAM. Um, I got a lot of support from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Once, once the chair of the department got up off the floor, when I, don't, I needed to go to London and Australia and Dublin and New York um, and Philadelphia. Uh, he was very helpful. So yeah, so so it was a really it was a really enriching, fantastic experience, and uh, and I can't wait to do it again. Fantastic! I think that is a fantastic way to end uh, what's been a hugely interesting conversation, uh, certainly from my perspective. And it just remains for me to show all of you once again the coffin ship, and to recommend it really, really enthusiastically. Again, I think this is an absolute triumph. Uh, the difficult second album was not so difficult after all, it turns out. And I know I'm looking forward to yours and Kathleen uh, Costello Sullivan's handbook from Routledge, which I think is going to be hugely important, which is an edited collection. 
And I think we all look forward to seeing what the, the third monograph looks like, which based on your pace, I'm looking for in about 2025. So <laughs> we'll, we'll be keeping uh, track of that. We'll see about that. <laughs> and holding you to it. But it's been a great pleasure uh, to, to talk to you. And thank you so much for joining us. And please, for those of you watching, pick up Kim McMahon's book, but also join us uh, for our next uh, interview uh, in the Klingon series from the Klingon Family Center for the Study of Modern Ireland here at the Keonocton Institute Prior Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin.